Um, the meetings on Syria, Turkey, and the Kurds. And I'm really pleased to say we've got two speakers. We have Ron Margulis uh, from our fraternal organization in Turkey. And we also have Riyath Nese from um, the Revolutionary Left Current in Syria. Speakers will speak first, then there'll be contributions, the normal format. There'll be a roving mic for people to speak into. And then the speakers will sum up at the end as normal. I'll take no further time now and hand over to Ronnie. Uh, comrades, some of you will have been at Alex's meeting yesterday evening, and there was a question there. Uh, the comrade didn't get up, sent in a slip. And the question was, um, are there revolutionaries, can one do revolutionary work in countries like Iran and Turkey? And I went like that. Um, <laughs> I should start by saying that the image you get of Turkey abroad is misleading. Um, yes, you can do everything that you do here as revolutionaries in Turkey. So we have uh, an organization of several hundred members, we publish uh, a newspaper and two journals. We do street sales of the paper. Um, we have stalls. Today, we're having a demonstration outside the Italian embassy about this um, woman, the German captain of a ship that helps refugees uh, in the Mediterranean. So, you know, we, we do everything you do here. And as you can see, I'm not in prison. Um, and I'm happy to say I've never been in prison. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, yes. Uh, um, but I've now reached the age when I'm thinking, what the hell? I mean, you know, what can they do to me? Um, but I'd still rather not be in prison, Alex is right. Now, um, this is not to say that there is no repression in Turkey. There is very serious repression if you're a Kurd. Not if you're any Kurd, if you're a politically active Kurd. And if you're on the left, but not uh, Kurdish, then you might go to prison over stuff you do to do with the Kurds. Um, anything else you can do and they're not bothered. I hate to say it, but it's probably because uh, the left in Turkey is not that big, and they're not that bothered uh, about us at the moment. Anyway, so, you know, the idea you might get from reading the Western uh, media, or watching it, uh, that, that Turkey is this dark, dungeon-like place where half the population is in prison is not true. You can do everything there that you can do here. Now, for the first time, I, I come to Marxism and do a talk like this practically every year. Well, every year. Um, and usually there is, I haven't had very much to report which was cheerful. This time, I have two things to report which are quite cheerful. One of them you'll have read about. It's the fact that for the first time since 2002, <clears throat> when the current government came into office, they've lost an important election for the first time in 17 years. They lost the local election, the municipal election in Istanbul. Now, this is immensely important. Istanbul accounts for one third of the Turkish economy. If you run Istanbul, it's like running Holland or Belgium. Um, it, it's like a country and it isn't just economically, in every other way too, it is the center of Turkey. If you run Istanbul, you will be running Turkey. If you're not 
already doing so. That's one, and I'll try to explain why it happened. And the other is, there was in Turkey between uh, 2010 and 2014, a peace process between the Turkish government and the Kurdish movement. The peace process was jettisoned in 2014, basically because of what happened in Syria, um, rather than anything that happened in Turkey. Öcalan, the leader of the Kurdish movement, has been in prison for many, many years. But during the peace process, there were talks with him. So he was a major actor in Turkish politics. But when the peace process came to an end in 2014, um, he was put into isolation and there has been no talks between the state and the Kurdish movement since 2015. This year, a couple of months ago, the talks, not peace talks, but at least communications with Öcalan in prison um, started again. Once again, this has not so much to do with what's going on in Turkey, but with what's going on in Syria. But again, I'll uh, say more about that. Now, from what I've said, you will have gathered that there are two major fault lines in Turkish society. And there have been since the Republic was founded in 1923. There is also half a fault line, a crack, a fissure, which has appeared recently, but not as important as the first two. They are, firstly, the fault line between a population which considers itself to be Islamic, considers itself to be Muslims, not in the sense of any kind of Islamic fundamentalism, but in describing themselves, being a Muslim will be part of their definition of, of themselves. And yet, we have a state founded in 1923, which is secular, westernized, uh, Islamophobic in many ways, and has kept believers, people who are openly Muslims, out of the public sector, away from the levers of power in the country, so, you know, j just to illustrate this, if you're a woman wearing a headscarf, you could not go to university. And equally importantly, you could not get a job in the public sector. Um, for many, many years in Turkey, getting a job in the public sector really meant that you made it. You may not think this these days, but it, that used to be the case. You could not be sacked. You were okay for life. Now, Muslim women could not do that if they had a headscarf. So this is, uh, without, I, I could talk about just this for hours, uh, but I can't. So the, the point is there has been this fault line between the state and the mass of the population who were kept out of public life in, in a whole number of ways. The second fault line is the more obvious one between the Turkish state and the Kurdish movement. Um, just a couple of sentences on that. The, the Kurds make up something like a fourth a fifth of the population. We don't know exactly because, of course, until very recently, the Turkish state did not recognize the existence of the Kurds. The official ideology was everyone in Turkey is a Turk. Now, even I'm not. I'm Jewish. You know, I have nothing to do with Central Asia, but this could not be talked about. For Kurds, even more 
because they re represent more of a danger to the official nationalistic uh, ideology of the state. They were not recognized. They were not allowed to speak their own language. They could receive no education in their own language. And for many, many years, this wasn't even an issue. It became an issue in the mid-1980s when the PKK, the main Kurdish organization, emerged and started um, armed struggle. Whatever we might think about armed struggle, what it meant was that it put the issue squarely into the center of Turkish politics. So that's the second fault line. Thanks. Now, the first fault line between the secular state and the more religious population explains why this government, Erdogan's government, has never lost an election for seven, what is it, 17 years. Because it's the first government in <coughs> Turkey which it's not an Islamic government by, by any stretch of the imagination. It's a very recognizable um, neoliberal conservative government. But it uses a religious language. And the people, ordinary people, recognize the language and sympathize with the government. More importantly, more concretely, what the government has done is to remove all the variety of constraints and restrictions and bans on religious people <coughs> in public life. So it has meant that for the first time since 1923, the majority, the mass of the population, mainly poor working class people, have been able to live their lives, go to work, without pretending to be atheists. Okay, I, I exaggerate, you didn't have to pretend to be atheist, but you certainly couldn't do anything openly religious. You couldn't have a headscarf. In a country, by the way, which is 99.9% uh, Muslims. Um, this explains why this government, even now, at the depths of a political and economic crisis, when it lost the election in Istanbul, um, it still got more than 49% of the vote. It still got half the vote. Um, nevertheless, they lost it. And they lost it in percentage terms, not by much, but they lost it by 800,000 votes. That is very substantial. Why did they lose it? They lost it for two reasons. The first is that Erdogan's increasing slide towards a more authoritarian style of government has been having an effect on his own base as well as everyone else. There are large numbers of people who have voted for the AKP, Erdogan's party, since 2002, who this time thought, this is too much. This man is becoming too dictatorial. The rule of law in the country is becoming too tenuous. It's being eaten away too much. And of this difference in votes of 800,000, at least half is um, people who normally, for the past 15, 17 years, voted for the AKP. Now, our organization has argued all along, since 2002, that the only way to defeat this government is to win over its base. This might seem very obvious to you, except that almost all of the Turkish left, a very large part of the Turkish left, opposes this government for being Islamic, opposes this government for being not secular enough. Um, 
And in doing so, of course, they're only saying to the government's social base, when we come back to power, we will exclude you once again. That's not the way to do it. The way, because the, I should stress, the people who vote for the AKP are poor working class people. It's very clear. You look at Istanbul in the equivalence of Kensington and Chelsea and Hampstead, the social democratic so-called opposition wins. In all the working class areas, the poorer districts, the AKP wins. So without winning over the poor working class base of the AKP, you cannot get rid of these people. Now, thanks. I am, of course, nowhere nearly finished, but I'll, I'll do my best. So, um, for the first time, there is now a rift between parts of the base of the AKP, the AKP voters, and the AKP leadership. It's taken a long time because of the factor I was talking about, the, the fight between secularism um, and ordinary Muslims. But the second factor is economic. I will not go into any kind of detail about the economy at all, but I've just seen a figure which is so striking, I will share it with you. There's something called the credit default swap. Those of you who are not economists or do not play on the financial markets may not know what it is. I didn't until I looked it up. Um, basically, it, it's a measure of how likely it is that the country will pay its over, overseas debt. And, and this is something banks work out. Now, at the depth of the debt crisis in Greece, the number in Greece for the, the credit default swap was 311. In Turkey at the moment, it's 492. No one thinks that Turkey will pay its debt. Therefore, everything becomes more expensive, <coughs> They cannot find credit on the international markets, etc. At the moment, Argentina is first, Venezuela is second, th Turkey is third, in terms of how high this figure is. So the economy has been going for the past two years seriously into crisis, and there is no sign of it getting any better. And it, it's obvious and visible every time you go shopping. Um, this is also a factor why they finally lost Istanbul. Let me say a few words about the second fault line before I get told off. And that sort of leads into what Gaeth is going to say quite nicely. After five years of no contact with Ojala and therefore uh, it's called low intensity war. That's what the state calls it um, in Turkey. So there isn't an open war with the Kurds, but every week there will be a few PKK members and a few Turkish um, soldiers dead. Two, three, five, every week. So it's sort of constant low level fighting. Um, in southeast Turkey, which is the Kurdish area. After five years, two months ago, Öcalan's brother was allowed to go and visit him. No one had been allowed to visit him for five years. His brother was allowed to visit him, and he brought out a letter from Öcalan. And this, this is weird, comrades, I know, but... You know, how, how can there be a war and then this guy's in prison and he sends a letter which goes to his organization in the mountains of Iraq uh, and of course the Turkish state organizes all of this. But that's how peace processes uh, work. Um, and in the letter, 
Öcalan says, our organized, the, our movement, the Kurdish movement, should be more sensitive to Turkey's sensitivities in Syria. What he means is this. The peace process ended in 2014 when in northern Syria, a Kurdish entity began to emerge. Rojava, you know, there, there are books about it here. Um, now, Turkey has a very long southeastern border. A small eastern part of it is with Iraq. Well, it's not with Iraq. It's with the Kurdish, what's it called these days? Uh, the, the, the Kurdish, effectively a Kurdish semi-autonomous state in northern Iraq. Hmm? Yeah. In, in the rest of this 600 kilometers long border is with Syria. Now, all of that northern part of Syria, which borders onto Turkey, is, is a Kurdish area. And as a result of the Syrian revolution, which turned into a, an unholy mess, the Kurds were able to set up a de facto autonomous state in northern Syria. This means that Turkey now has a long border with Kurds, both in Iraq and in Syria, and this is not acceptable to the Turkish state, I know. Um, it's not acceptable for two reasons. One is you cannot fight a war with a Kurdish organization within your country and border onto a huge Kurdish area outside. Secondly, it's not acceptable because if the Kurds in Iraq and Syria get semi-autonomous and then autonomous and then possibly completely independent new states, the Turkish state thinks, what are my Kurds going to do? Of course, they will be thinking, which, which they are anyway, we want an independent state as well. So Turkey had to stop the possibility of a Kurdish state ar arising in northern Syria. That's why they stopped the peace process in Turkey. And for the past five years, they've been arguing, the Turkish state has been arguing with the Americans, saying, please let us go in to northern Syria. There's something we need to smash in northern Syria. But they get no permission. You know the reason, because the Kurdish forces in Syria have been effectively America's forces on the ground um, in Syria. So this was a problem. Clearly now, we don't know any details because this has not been declared or announced. The Russians, the Americans, and the Turks are about to reach some sort of agreement in northern Syria. There, there are indications of what it might be. They'll have a buffer zone which will be policed by uh, the Turks and the Americans and the Russians. They're, they're clearly discussing all of this. Now, if that happens, then Turkey is able once again to, to talk with the Kurds within Turkey. This has been happening just for a few, for the past few months. It's immensely important, very promising, because these two fault lines, it will not have escaped you, are between secularist and believer, and between Turk and Kurd, split the working class in Turkey right down the middle in two different ways. Until these fault lines are overcome, it is very difficult for the Turkish working class to engage in any kind of united action. There are seven trade union confederations in Turkey. You've got one. It's not very good, but you've got one. There are seven in Turkey because there's one dominated by the Kurds, one dominated by Turks, one dominated by Islamists, one dominated by secularists. And they never act together 
until these fault lines are overcome, it's very difficult for the Turkish working class to do anything. The half fault line I talked about, final sentence, is the Syrian refugees, comma. <laughs> there are three and a half to possibly four million Syrian refugees in Turkey. And the anti-Syrian racism in Turkey, you might think, well, they're all Muslims and they're all from the Middle East, they're much the same. They're not. Turks hate Arabs. Turks look down upon Arabs. Um, they consider Arabs the same thing that any Western European racist considers Arabs. There's exactly the same thing in Turkey. And this is a further fault line which needs to be overcome. <laughs> Over the past six months, our organization, maybe 80% of the work we've been doing has concerned Syrian refugees. It's becoming that serious. Having said Syria, I'll now pass the mic over to our Syrian comrade. Thank you. A Syrian comrade from the Revolutionary Left Current there, Riyas Naiseh, and he'll be speaking in Arabic uh, with a translator. Good morning for you all. So I, I, I wanted to speak in French uh, at the beginning, and our comrade Johar, he, he comes uh, early, so I will speak in Arabic. Okay. I don't need micro. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, comrades. For sure, what uh, comrades Roni uh, mentioned is the proof of the interrelations between the people's struggles in, in, in the region. We are now living in a period of revolutions and counter-revolutions and imperialism uh, intervention. And the rise uh, and, and the great rise of, uh, uh, of peoples. And with this, with this context, uh, the rise of the uh, Kurdish people struggle. We should not uh, forget that the Kurdish people are the only people in the region divided between four, four countries and uh, deprived from all rights in all these countries. And I need to do a, a quick introduction and presentation uh, about the uh, political leadership of the uh, Kurdish people. There is a leadership with, uh, with Parazani in uh, the north of uh, Iraq. Uh, in coalition with the Turkish state. And in the south of the uh, uh, Kurdistan of Iraq. Sorry? Ah, the capital Suleimania, with the leadership of the uh, um, the, National Union. the National Union of Kurdistan, Talbani, and and is closer to Iran. But this uh, historical divide between uh, Talabani and Barazani uh, ended. Uh, 
ذلك اليوم منذ أكثر من عشرين عاما أن القيادة الشعبية البارزة للشعب الكردي هي PKK. We have to accept that the uh, from since twenty years that the uh, pre the leadership that is present to the people is the PKK. PKK in Turkey and the parties that are close to it. PYD in Syria. PYD in Syria. PJAK in Iraq. PJAK in Iraq. إذن هناك صورة واضحة أن هذا قيادة سياسية للشعب الكردي اليوم علينا أن نعترف هي الفكرة والأحزاب شقيقة لهم. So that's the leadership of the Kurdish people today. That's what we have to recognize. Now I will go back to the Syrian uh, situation. So in, in, uh, briefly, last year I, uh, I used to say that the situation in Syria is very complicated and complex. It becomes more complicated today. It got more complicated today. Okay, so very briefly, the situation is we, we've been defeated as, as a revolution. But with all revolutions, <laughs> ah, okay, like, like the, the taupe under the ground, I don't know if that's the right name. If you close one hole here, he will come out from another hole. <laughs> this is how he sees the situation in Syria. There are today in Syria three areas. One areas under the uh, Bashar Assad's uh, regime control. Some areas under Turkish control with some other militias, uh, with the help of some other militias, Islamic militias. And some other areas under autonomous self-administration. Last year, uh, two years ago, I used to talk about the necessity of linking the uh, struggle of democratic uh, democrats around uh, these three areas. We can say that the autonomous uh, area or experience was allowed to exist uh, because of the Syrian revolution. The weakness of the regime made, uh, pushed him to withdraw his uh, forces from uh, several areas in uh, north uh, west uh, Syria. East. Uh, East Syria, sorry. And the, uh, the popular party, uh, political party that was existing there is the POD. And uh, they managed to take control of that area after the withdrawal of the regime. And like we witnessed last year, uh, there is some sort of um, uh, duality of power. In, 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 in very specified uh, areas. As an example, in year 2012-2013, south of Syria was under uh, was out of the uh, was not under the control of the regime and under the 
control of some uh, Islamist militias. Not far from uh, Damascus, there were also some areas that were out of, are not under the control of the regime, under the control of the uh, Islamic army. Army, army, army of Islam. This is one example of uh, duality of power in these areas. But the uh, the politics that was uh, that was dominating in these areas were uh, very reactionary. Now the regime has taken over again this uh, power uh, in these areas. And the only place that uh, is still uh, witnessing this duality of power is the uh, autonomous uh, area, the autonomous Kurdish area. Now, this, this area is, is quite special. We cannot talk about a Kurdish area only. Uh, because this area now extended and managed to take other areas that are uh, like our uh, historically areas where Arabs live, like Deir Zur and, and Raqqa. Thirty-five percent of the Syrian uh, land is now under the autonomous uh, entity. Four million people live in this area now. Very, very, very briefly, and I'll let, for, uh, let, it, uh, let you discuss later, what are the uh, specificities of this area? Yeah, yeah he describes as uh, there is an experience of communes there. And there are like popular uh, people's councils later. And on top of that, there is uh, a, 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 a higher and, and higher general council. The second point is the question of women's liberation. We haven't witnessed an experience in, in the revolution where the women have, are uh, participating in all uh, levels, uh, social levels, political levels, and uh, leadership. And this is... Before he goes to, to, to visit the area, he was expecting it will be uh, a decision coming from the top without real uh, and practical uh, implication on the ground. Now I can say that this is a reality and has a, a real implication on everyday's life. And uh, this is of great importance as we haven't witnessed not only in Syria but across the region we haven't uh, witnessed such an experience. And all the leaderships, uh, all the leaders that I have met there 
like there are equalities uh, between genders. But this equality is fake. Because the main uh, decision uh, go, uh, goes back to the, to the existing woman. To, to, women leaders. to, to the women leaders. They uh, decided to, uh, uh, to stop polygamy, to, to forbid uh, polygamy in the area. The second point is heritage, which is usually uh, the woman inherits half of, of men. This has been also uh, stopped. In reality, the main slogans that are widespread there, without forgetting the EPG, the, the, the women's... Uh, Protections, protections yes. units. So what is the slogan that is widespread there in the area? Jin Jian Azadi. Woman, freedom, life, woman, freedom. Life, woman, freedom. I don't know Kurdish. I don't know Kurdish. This is a very deep experience, and for us, the uh, uh, revolutionary Syrians in. Uh, we are very uh, involved in this experience. And we consider that the uh, autonomous area con uh, constitutes for us and for uh, all people fighting for democracy in Syria a refuge for us and a, a back base and an area for collaboration and uh, and and the way to uh, to have uh, interaction with the comrades there and spread our socialist ideas and we uh, are operating as a revolutionary socialist uh, group in these areas. So no, no one understand me wrong. This is not a socialist uh, experience at all. But it, 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 uh, it, it is a real democratic experience which with social and democratic dynamics. And this is the only uh, point in the, the Syrian mess. Or that we can use and leverage on to, to rise up again and uh, struggle and fight again. But there are many challenges and risks of, and dangers for this experience. The risk, the risk from the Turkey, Turkish state, as uh, Comrade Roni mentioned, The, the risks from the, from the regime, from the Syrian regime. <coughs> and uh, 
and the and the different groups of ISIS that are still there. And the fact that the experience is uh, encircled, besieged. besieged. Thank you. It's besieged by Turkey, uh, Iraq, and uh, the regime. And, and in all experience, when an experience is besieged and uh, doesn't spread, the revolution doesn't spread in other areas, it will end up by, by, dis by failing and disappearing. And, and there are great dangers for the experience if there is no real solidarity between the people of the region, between the uh, progressist socialist in, in, in other areas. The experience will end up not only military, they will not uh, lose military, but also the experience may. And, and therefore, we, we need solidarity, uh, critical, solidarity. critical solidarity, but first international solidarity. Thank you.